Okay, welcome to episode 10 of New York City Bike Culture. I'm sitting here, extremely excited to sit here for the second time actually, with Alia Tyus Barnwell. Uh, we met like a month or so ago, uh, location, the sound just didn't pan out, so I'm really excited to be here with you um, at um, Alex Ostroy, Ostroy uh, cycling brand, um, apparel brand and all that. Um, their location here at Industry City in Brooklyn, uh, Sunset Park, Industry City. Um, it's been very, uh, very grateful that we're allowed to sit here and talk in a much quieter environment, which is great. Um, um, sitting here with Aliyah, who I was really excited to talk about. We got a variety of topics, I think, um, to, to get into. You're um, still somewhat of a de beginning developing cyclist. You're not a bike ra racer, but you're potentially going to be one in 2021 if, uh, if the season will allow it. That part. Um, you um, have been riding road bikes for a while, though. Uh, you were uh, born and raised in New York City, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, more specifically. You live in Brooklyn right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you also run a nonprofit called Ride Upgrades, mm -hmm. uh, which took me a while to get used to the name and parse it, kind of. But I've, I've gotten it now. I've looked at the website. I understand what you're doing, um, which I think is really great work. Uh, and yeah, we got a, a ton of topics, but why don't we start with you introducing yourself a little bit, uh, growing up, uh, I said born and raised in Brooklyn, but how did, how was that, and how did you get into bikes eventually? Um, I'm assuming uh, that, was a, that wasn't that was the first thing you started in terms of sports and all that. No, it wasn't the first thing I started in terms of sports. Obviously, we were all asked to do some kind of sport in school, and I think my earliest sport that I was, like, required to do was, the, that I, like, you know, gave into the peer pressure was volleyball. Mm. Um, and being the tall, awkward kid, like, of course, or girl, like, of course, they, it's either basketball or volleyball, those are the two things. Um, and I never really loved it as much as, you know, you're forced to do something. It's not the mm -hmm. same as, like, certainly we're not going to compare volleyball to riding a bike, right? Not at all. Um, was into equestrian sports, but if you want to, like, throw money away, I'm sure there's, there's, like, fewer sports that are more expensive than cycling, and equestrian sports is one of them. So, obviously, in, in New York City, as somebody who, like... You know, growing up in a, in a single parent household, that was just not something that was going that I was going to keep up with. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't regret that. Looking back on it, I kind of feel a little bad for all the horses. I'm like, oh, you know, poor babies. Whatever the case is, yeah, that was what I did early on. Um, and I got into cycling, like, I want to kind of blame my dad. Like, my dad is a member of the Red Caps. So when I was young, I was one of the few kids who was being rousted in the morning to go, like, to Prospect Park to watch guys going around in a circle really fast. Um, and I remember going to Harlem Crit when I was a kid a few times and, you know, sitting there and watching them go around and, like, I understood what cycling was at a young age and really start riding to get around until after college. Like, I rode for fun and, you know, that was a thing, but I wasn't really, like, hardcore ride everywhere, hashtag ride everywhere type of person until after school. Awesome. Yeah, uh, for those who regularly watch, you can tell this is a little bit different. That's a little bit more of an interview conversation. This is serving a dual purpose. Uh, we're working on something else too. Um, but so that's why my constant arms and ahs are out of here at the moment, which is great probably because I, I actually like to let you t uh, finish your sentences because I was like three times already. I'm like, oh, I want to ask more about that. So I'm going to ask some follow up questions okay. though. Because I was like, yeah, I got into soccer back in Germany because that's what you did in Germany. Everybody tries at least once to play soccer unless your family is absolutely anti it. It's like, you know, basketball, like you said. And if you're the tall, slightly overweight kid at the time, then, then you're going to get put in goal. And you got put in a volleyball. <laughs> um, so, so, and Aliyah is tall. You're like 6'2 or something like I'm that? I'm 5'11. 6'2. Even with cleats, I wish. But no, I'm 5'11, five, five, yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that. Um, Maybe how that, if that was uh, like an object at all, getting into cycling, um, and and when you started, really, you said your dad was into it. Um, so your dad was a cyclist, and he was with the Red Caps. He's still with the Red Caps. He us. is still a cyclist, and he is still with the Red Caps. He's still out there. When if you're making the laps of Prospect Park and you see those guys on the bench, my dad is one of those guys. So tell us two questions, then maybe tell us a little bit more, um, like 
transitioning from volleyball and not liking that and maybe not liking other sports either because yeah you're, you're tall so you're going to get cast for volleyball and basketball that's where the girls go if they're tall right mm -hmm. I, I always joke about that if my daughter's going to go tall hopefully a basketball or volleyball scholarship for college right I, 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 i'm kidding of course but that's well, like the first thing going to be in time trial i don't know if why she's going to be tall they're going <laughs> to they're push her that way right, right. And, and i think that's what happened to you so how did you make the transition from from that then to cycling was that all your dad was that because a lot of kids react well they look at what the dad soon as like you that's stupid dad you're riding laps in prospect park was that for the longest time your attitude and that changed somehow what, what happened there i think my dad and me were never my dad never tried to force me into it as a sport he would take me out and take me around but i was always on a mountain bike probably you know that's a discussion for my dad i'll ask him later why mountain bike and why not road when i was younger but um my dad never forced it on me as a sport it was just kind of like something that you do to have fun with the family and maybe that was, I'm sure looking back on it now that we're working together and riding grades, he's like, he's using this opportunity. I do have a brother and I'm, I think he tried to encourage my brother to take mm. up those paths. Um, there is a traditional, my dad's a traditional West Indian guy and uh, perhaps girls, um, especially at, you know, my age or when I was young, that's not so much a priority to try and force your daughter into sports in general. It's not a priority, right? So I feel like there's a chance, he's probably looking at it like, oh, I missed my opportunity <laughs> to have someone, you know, come along and be like this crazy superstar or whatever. Uh, I just want to ride my bike. I don't really, you know, as of now, how did I get into it? I kind of, I think it was really a friend of mine. Um, I kind mm. of credit like women that encouraged me to take this a little bit more seriously. A friend of mine, Tracy Norton, who's also now working with me in Ride Up Grades, um, was a triathlete, training, tri a triathlete training for her triathlon, first triathlon at the time. And uh, she had her nice dry bike, and I had the mountain bike that's like a hard rock that my dad gave me. And I was like, oh, she's like, come on, let's take a lap around the park. Um, I go on this lap, and oh my gosh, if you've ever ridden Prospect Park, there's that one hill. That hill's not a thing, mind you. This is not a real hill. This is not, it's like 30 minutes at max. Um, it is not a 20 minute climb. Uh, I died. I didn't just say, I don't, you know, I didn't get off, but I was definitely like, you're able to talk so easily and you're barely pedaling and I'm over here feeling like I'm going to die There might have been blood coming out of my eyes. I'm not sure um, By the time I got back to the top of that hill I was like this is I should be stronger than this and that was probably where that's I remember where it's like started where I was like, okay, it's time to we're gonna get another bike We're gonna start riding all the time We're gonna ride to work and I really started to stick when I rode to work once um, And it was took me either like think about the same amount of time as it would have taken me on the train and obviously I didn't pay anything to do that. And of course you feel great because you've had all these endorphins. They're like, why would I ever go back to taking the train? And it kind of grew from there. Like, you know, after a while you try to find more ways to be comfortable riding in and the kit becomes a thing. And when I first started riding, I was like, oh, I'll never, I'll never wear a lycra. That's stupid. Why do you have to wear tight clothes? This is dumb. I don't ever want to change clothes. I didn't ever want to change clothes and I didn't ever want to get big legs. Now I'm like, I'm clearly committed to the clothing thing. And the next thing is like, all right, strength training this winter because big legs are a necessity. Big legs translate to effective speed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We cyclists have these, well, depending on how serious you are, but the pro cyclists at least are these very emaciated dudes and girls and like very skinny. And then they have the big, big giant thighs. Right. So which is not everybody's look, but it's a, it stands out. Um, so when you, when you had that experience with your friend, uh, Tracy, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, how old were you? And so it sounded like you were already past high school professional and yeah, then was... you remembered kind of, oh yeah, my dad's also doing this. And you kind of had a little bit of a connection point already. Did that help? Mm -hmm. It helped a little bit. Like when I, I, so I went out and I told you about another bike. I got like a beat up old tour, a Raleigh tour that now has been like on with Seneca Village Bicycles. Hey, thanks a lot, Jason. Um, but I knew that that was not really that great. Or my dad, apparently the word was getting back because I was doing laps in the park. So of course, him being on the side, you know, gossip, people gossip. Word was getting back on riding this thing. He's like, I can't have that. <laughs> Let me dig through my, you know, room of bicycles and find something that's going to work. And he had this old, uh, it was an OCLV 500 or whatever. Okay, um, like a so, Trek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> full carbon, old full carbon bike was beat to all get out, but... I was able to get around nice. It was like a, it was a nine speed, um, 105 on it. And I was able to get around on it and the love of, I was so much faster, so much faster. Once you like that jump in speed and like responsiveness and just everything, I was like, I'll never, never go back. Yeah. There's no way you're going back. 
And they, it just kind of took off from there. Like, once I was able to get to work faster than the train, there was no way I was going back. And I think you're not the, the first one to mention that, that that appeal of, like, being able to move around the city so quickly on a bicycle once mm-hmm. you get comfortable to. Yeah. And once you acquire a little bit of fitness, I think that's appealing to a lot of people. Uh, did you... Did your dad ever feel like you said you got to talk to him? Did you ever feel like he put his his, uh, his money on the wrong horse by uh, getting your brother trying to get your brother to cycling first, then without him really doing anything for it? You said, like you said, Western <laughs> culture, like many cultures, right? Gender kind of, and and you yeah. now as an adult woman being really into bikes, is that weird for him, or has it come around? I have not beat him over the, de- over the ho- I've not beat him over the head with it. I've just asked like, how's my brother doing? Like, oh, how's we took my brother out, and and he. We're going to revisit that. I'm not going to give up. Like, obviously, okay. now it's the two of us. I'm going to encourage my brother to ride more. Blah, blah, blah. Got bikes in the house. What's the problem? But yeah, he might have. Obviously, the kid's not doing it. But that's. We have to kind of like take responsibility, right? Like, as adults, that we didn't encourage them or put them in a position where they would love it and like kind of make it fold it into their lives. Everybody's not going to be like the person who wants to wear like her all the time and get big lives. That's fine. Um, but. They should at least feel comfortable to have their own little crew and maybe find some way. Like, okay, you're going to use a bike to get around. You're going to use a bike. Maybe you do BMX. Maybe you do mountain. Maybe you, like, just want to ride your bike and put on some gravel knobbies and go ride in a park somewhere or something. Um, but I feel like he's not quite getting that. So, yeah, he may be. I feel like my dad's never going to admit that. He's probably never going to admit, like, oh, I bet I'm the wrong person and I should have. No, that doesn't sound like my father at all. <laughs> uh, I'm familiar with family dynamics like that. Although my dad's a little different, uh, they all got their own unique, yeah, uh, yeah. sets of characteristics. Um, coming back a little bit to the red caps, um, mm-hmm. you mentioned that. Can you can you briefly explain what the red caps, who the red caps are? Um, because I, I'm gonna lie. Last time we talked about them, I had heard of them, but I, I googled a little bit. So I've done my research a little bit. There's a New York Times article from like two or three years, not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, and maybe also. The, did they play a role at all in, in you you finding cycling or finding cycling normal, maybe? Because uh, we've talked about this a little bit already last time, but um, it, cycling is a predominantly white sport. Is a predominantly male sport. Um, and I know people, some people are tired of hearing that, but it's the reality, right? Um, and I think, uh, obviously, you're the first black person on the show here uh, for me. Um, that's because, for me, also, the... the when you talk to the circle of friends, how many black people are there who are cyclists? The mm. number's pretty small, right? Um, but oh, don't worry, we'll get you out. There you and go. Introduce yeah, the and, and, and I'll, I'll connect to more people for sure. That's <laughs> the goal for 2021. Yeah. Yeah. But, but coming back, so th- who, are the, who are the red caps? And then mm-hmm. do you feel like having uh, maybe not role models, a group of role models, but, but cycling being normal for people in, in your family, uh, with friends and people that your parents interacted with just in, in, in your community, if you will, was that part of, for you, like cycling being normal also then and being a, a sport that is totally normal and you could get into? Um, well, I'll start with the answer to your first question. The red caps um, are, uh, I'm going to give the like not politically correct answer. They're the West Indian arm, or at least the original West Indian, mostly male arm of like uh, black cycling clubs in the city. Uh-huh. So it was NLM Tours, and they uh, were founded by two sisters. I think they're from the Upper East and Upper West Side. And they did, like, leisurely black rides. They broke off from NYCC in, like, the 70s, I think. And then there was another split after that where you had Major Taylor and the Red Caps. I think they, they both split off from L&M. L&M was, like, the big black club or a club of people who was of color, a BIPOC club. And um, Major Taylor was... But the problem was I think most of them were, like not I think it was one it was two women and most of them weren't trying to like race or anything like that so then you got Major Taylor which was trying to do a little bit more aggressive longer rides and they were based in New York um, and the, the person who took over from L&M is based in New Jersey so that's how that split happened and then you had a group that's just extra hardcore and mostly all West Indian and that's the Red Caps and they all kind of like formed from that they've been around for forever they have a crazy mean reputation they're nice guys okay. so um Got cut off you for a minute, but uh, let's let's pick it up again with the red caps. So first, tell mm-hmm. us a little bit more about the red caps, and mm-hmm. and with that, um, I think you've already hinted at that. Maybe also a little bit the history of um, black cycling clubs or black cycling groups in New York City that you're a little bit familiar with, at least. Yeah, at least a little bit. Okay, so L and M Tours, um, and I can't remember the names of the individual women. I think the one of them that's still with us is Mildred and her sister L. I'm gonna Google that one later. 
uh, founded LNM Tours um, when they broke off from riding with NYCC. Again, NYCC is not a bad group. They just didn't feel like, you know, that welcoming little bit of extra that makes you feel like you're welcome to come back to return to ride with a group. Um, I think one of them was interviewed by Velo News recently. Yes, I saw that interview. I was just going to reference that too. Good. Okay, so we can refer people in the audience back to that. That yeah. was Velo News. I wasn't sure if it was Cycling Tips or Velo News. It was Velo News, let's say. Oh, let's uh, go with that. No. And they definitely had an in-depth <laughs> kind of talk about, uh, I think it was the kind of some of the founding manager, uh, major members Taylor of Major members, Taylor. And they talked mm-hmm. about L&M and then mm-hmm. how they split up because... I think the, the person was in charge and I moved to New Jersey and then there was it. like, uh, it was just geographically difficult and it wasn't even so much of politics. I don't think it was more of a, well, we're a New York City group, so we create our own thing in the major tailor. So mm-hmm. uh, that's exactly right. it. Yeah. He, you got it exactly right. So l m was kind of like split off and found, was really doing most of the rides in New Jersey. It was hard for major tailor folks or from people from here and people from color from here that were riding with that club to get from New York, obviously over to Newark or whatever they were starting those rides. And they broke off and did form Major Taylor, and then you had a subset of that that was red. That was the Red Caps, and I feel like there is a little bit of national pride going on there because it is, um, or maybe geographical pride, mostly from a West Indian or Caribbean, um, and most of I don't say all, but most of Major Taylor is like American, Black, mm-hmm. African American. Um, so that's the difference there. The Red Caps is, you know, mostly West Indian and mostly male. On that note, with the uh, um, we got a little microphone adjustment here. Uh, it's all a little professional, more professional this time. Uh, on that note, with the with the kind of the national cultural pride or geographic, like you know, uh, I think that's that's also important to, uh, to mention. As as in twenty twenty, uh, thankfully more attention has uh, been on black cyclists. Uh, the Williams brothers and Major Taylor, I feel like, are the two examples that everybody has talked to now. Um, not not the little people like me because I'm near more New York City focused anyway, mm-hmm. but literally Velo News, all the uh, cycling tips, uh, cycling news. Let's not forget Aisha McGowan. I feel like we just I, sorry, rushed right over. But but has she gotten the same amount of attention? She got her contract. That is that is excellent. Yes, but well, I, mean, I, I don't think she has the she has the mainstream media presence. No, I suppose right? not. She's not as now that she's she's met she her should, goal. But... She should, but she met her goal. So I'm I feel like a little bit of is like all right, let me relax now. Other people can finally take over this baton, and I can like enjoy my life for a second. You know, because you've been out here fighting the good fight for a while, I'd probably get tired too, constantly being annoyed and constantly being approached anytime anybody wants to ask anything about race. You've got somebody in your face asking a question. But she kind of was, when it, I think back to when I started doing, riding faster than, like, is normal. <laughs> um, I remember looking on Strava and being like, nobody, or like looking around, besides just looking around and not seeing anyone else pulling up with a red light next to you, like, that looks like you. There was only like one or two black women mm-hmm. in the top ten. And we won't even say like top, you know, we're talking about Strava. Sorry, Strava for being shallow, whatever. There are not that many of us. Um, if you, even if you're like in other social media forms, say like Instagram or like Facebook, where you're in those groups that are NYCC's members group or like social cycling, social cycling is a mixed bag. That's a different one. But like you're in these traditional cycling spaces, you're not going to see a lot of people that look like me. So when I saw her, I didn't know who she was at the time. I was like, Oh, Brown, unambiguously black girl. I'm not alone. That was really it. And that's how I found my way. So Tracy kind of got me on the bike and then I found my way to Black Girls Do Bike because I was looking for other people who looked like me. I realized that I did not want to be like, I wasn't going to ride with the bike Barbies at, at Rafa because that was the other. I was like, oh, women's groups. Okay, I understand. I'm not going to, like, I really don't want to try and like hang on desperately to the end of a men's um, ride uh, all the time. Um, and it kind of puts a damper on their situation. Like riding with my dad, that was the one thing that I realized. These old dudes want to talk about old Dude stuff and I don't necessarily want to hear that or have to like put a damper on their mission I certainly can't necessarily identify with everything and have that conversation any conversations with them about everything um so I started looking for my own group found uh black girls do bike which was at the time run by uh Courtney Williams who's now the bike mayor brown bike girl um and she was the one who was like okay this is a thing that you can like do you you have a certain number of skills you're not a complete idiot here show people how to like change tires <laughs> at least basic stuff like that and uh christina sepulveda who was at the time working for bike new york i think now she works for a couple political campaigns she was saw me like asked basically asked black girls do bike to send a representative to do uh their tire change demo at the bike uh expo that they have every year or well, not this year but I guess where they have every year, and that's where I was like, oh, I mean, you should be a teacher. You should probably be a coach and, like, teach people how to 
huge kids because you're engaging or at least amusing. I try to keep it light, you know. And it all kind of went from there. I was like, what? That's a job? You people get paid to do that? Okay, sure. And it kind of went from there. And I was like, you know, I, I just wonder that there isn't kind of more support for that. But that's a conversation for later, I guess, in this sit down. Well, I think you've already, there's already four or five directions I want to go in from here, which is all great. Right. Um, so, but I think you may not feel that way. I think you do probably feel that way, but you tell me. Um, you're a minority within minority, right? You're, you're yes. a woman and also a black cyclist. And we, we talk about the black cyclists. And there are actually some more male-dominated groups. Major Taylor has women, too, also in the leadership, for all I know. Um, the, the red caps you just said are male-only, really, um, at least in terms of active members. Um, yeah. So it's hard for you to find a group, but that's maybe the beauty of a place like New York City that even for a relative minority within a minority, that it, they're, even there, there's groups of like-minded people that you eventually stumble upon. But was it, was it hard then um, getting into the sport, like you, that journey you just described from one group to the next, that sounds kind of natural almost, that it just kind of happened? Or do you feel like um, you had to work for it a little bit and, and it, it, it was off-putting that it was that hard to get into it uh, at first? Um, I didn't find it, I mean, I, I'm, you're probably talking to the wrong one about that particular aspect of it because I'm my mom's only child. So if I'm going to find something or find people, I need to like put myself out there or find something. Like at, at a certain point I had started to say no a lot. And I think cycling kind of was like that moment to just say yes. Just say yes. See what happens. If you don't like it, you can go home. Get on your bike, ride home. Um, so that kind of opened some doors for me. I guess a little bit. It was nice to be able to. I didn't really feel like it was that hard because those groups existed. If those groups didn't exist, I don't know. So yeah, there. I mean, I'll put it to you like this. Uh, did a job with Bike New York like a week or so ago, and the young woman that was there had never like. She was another instructor. Has never ridden over the bridge and has never like a dope bike. Clearly capable, but never found like a group to ride with. So I'm like, and this is she's white, mind you. Mm -hmm. Well, at least I. She presents as white. I uh, will have to ask her if she, uh, what she actually is. But just the fact that she even couldn't find something tells me that there is something that we probably need to work on. Thankfully, you know, um, we have some folks who stepped in, like Jessica, and you got to talk to her. It was creating spaces for people that are welcoming, and I think um, maybe saw also the other Velo News interview with the Major Taylor it was like a follow up where Natasha, who is one of the board members of Major Taylor, was speaking about how people like approached her recently when she was waiting for her friends at Grand Army Plaza, where cycles always meet up. Random group of white guys was just like, hey, what you doing? You, you guys want, you want to ride with us? You waiting for somebody? And she was like, shocked that normally that was like the old days that might not have happened. That he maintained conversations, still struck her up, gave her that like, you know, obligatory second question, like, are you sure? You know, like these are signs that people are more aware and are trying and making an effort i think um but yeah there was clearly a little bit of a gap we're lucky here new york you know we got access to things we just have to make a little bit more access for people who are as you say like maybe are not willing to like go out and like look like i let my fingers do the walk and then i found somebody that was open to having me there or we could already create a space for people like me um anybody who's maybe not used to letting their fingers do the walking or maybe isn't like so outgoing or doesn't even think to like you know they're COVID's kind of a hard this has been a hard year so people who are just finding their way into this are not necessarily going to add another layer of like trying to seek a community around it like they're just trying to keep their head above water so you kind of have to meet people where they're at you know are you so i fully agree with that and i think new york city is, is great in that way because there's people like when people for everybody but at the same time because this city can be a jungle too it can be really hard to find these groups right and uh, you you kind of mentioned Strava going out there and looking at leaderboards, and I think Jessica used the same thing for recruiting people. I remember that she's like, "Who's riding? Who's the woman? Who like are they affiliated with the team?" And then you do your own research, and it, it can be hard work, right? Mm -hmm. But it can pay off. Um, so on that note of you noticing or hearing reports, maybe not noticing yourself that um, black cyclists are getting more respect or getting or there's different interactions happening that maybe weren't happening before. Mm -hmm. um, it, is that what you're what you've always been hoping or waiting for like i mean i, I really feel like we should be celebrating uh people and let's just say largely white people for for doing the thing they should always have been doing um so i, I don't want to present this as like oh my god it's fantastic right this is just like what should be happening anyway <laughs> yeah um, i was gonna say of saying hello to a random person that you mean like this is a sign that people aren't monsters i guess you know what i mean but do i 
do I take it as a larger sign that people are maybe aware? Or, I don't know. Honestly, that it just it was nice to to allow people to have an, even have that as a thought. Like just the fact that she had that as a thought, that's a sign. That's a good sign. Uh, as far as it being like an, a national awareness thing that's like living this very white or like even international with Kevin Reza and that whole, you know, thing. Uh, baby steps, I guess would be the thought. Baby steps. Because yeah. I'm not, you know, they're still trying to figure it out. Like, what was it? $10,000? $10,500 to get into uh, the collegiate cycling program or whatever that USAC just put out? Is oh, that... yeah. Don't get me started on collegiate cycling. I think there's a lot of, that's a whole other issue that we, we could talk about. That oh, yeah. I feel like I need someone who is just really into that. Mm -hmm. um, that's I, I was in collegiate cycling and I, oh. I had some, well, I, I was in college for way too long and then eventually uh, like, <laughs> too many degrees and eventually uh, yeah ended up in the collegiate cycling team and it, and i think they, they, they're losing some opportunities there i think that that and, and they're, they're steering that in a different direction or in, in in directions that maybe make sense but in, in other ways don't make sense anyway that, that's yeah. a whole different topic but back on that aisha mcgon right mm -hmm. um i'm just gonna call her the most prominent maybe strongest uh female black cyclist in the united states maybe i'm wrong um uh african-american African-American. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure there may be some other like black identified. Uh, well, I'm like, thinking of like Naomi Campbell is the pro Pelton where she's from Trent Tobago and she's not American. So like those kind of, I, I'm, I can't think of a, but again, my, my knowledge might be more limited there. Can't think of another African-American uh, woman. She's now gotten a contract. Um, she's been very outspoken um, with regards to uh, questions of like Chloe Deigert very easily getting a, a contract with Canyon SRAM, which I think is what they're still called. And I think Rafa, the clothing brand, has still after that spoken after the fact that she got hired. Mm -hmm. um, you you mentioned her now. Fortunately, I've gotten a contract and mm -hmm. her carrying the torch in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that it takes characters like that to bring that message out there and bring the sport forward? Are you thankful for her? Do you feel like, oh my God, this, this, this poor woman has had a lot on her shoulders? Yeah, uh, I'm thankful yeah. for her. And yeah, I do feel like she's been bearing the cross for, yeah, she's been bearing the cross. I mean, did it work out? Like, ultimately that's a yeah, personal question for her. You know what I mean? Like if she obviously worked out for the rest of us finally they started paying attention now would that have happened if it wasn't like a con i feel like it was a convergence of events like covid being giving people time because i got time today is definitely the moniker for 2020 um and you know unfortunately the protests that were as a result of police brutality and it kind of like drew attention to black people not really being where we thought that they we should be or whatever have you um I'm sorry, can you rephrase the question? No, that, that's okay. I think um, I think I got what I wanted, actually. Yeah. Uh, let, let, me, let me move on. Um, yeah. Because related to that, though, do you feel, and I'm putting you in that position right now, too, mm -hmm. um, as a black cyclist, and then even as a female black cyclist, do you feel like you have now also, you're, you're, you're carrying a lot of that weight and you are being asked to speak for a lot of people and because you are seen as this representative, hey, there's a black woman on a yep. bike. Anytime there's a black person. Uh, so what do you think yes. and where are the solutions and don't you have all the answers? <laughs> don't I have all the answers? Having more than one black person around will allow, or just like you wouldn't ask the one white, it's kind of messed up when you have one person of a given type, they're expected to speak for as a representative for that entire type. And while that does, you know, make way for other people in that group, it's an unfair representation and places a lot of pressure on that person and reflects the, the main issue is that you don't have diversity. If you had diversity, you wouldn't have to be reliant upon this one person to be a representative for this entire group. Yeah. Um, you know, there, you know, variety is the spice of life, I think is the saying. Um, diversity probably would help with innovation. Just some random thoughts to toss out there. Um, as far as the Chloe Dygert thing, that was a perfect example of like, okay, you're going to vet the black people up and down, but this check, you didn't even check her tweets. You have this entire, you know, moral rectitude thing that they're trying to uphold, but they didn't think to back, back check this person's social media. Come on now. Y'all getting a little lazy. So, and then they didn't really do anything about it when they found out. They like, give her a little slap on the wrist. We didn't really do anything. So, I mean, you know. Do I feel like somebody saying hello at Granary Plaza is a massive sign of a change of the industry? No, I do not. Is it a good sign that humans are getting a little more humane? Yes. That's where I am. Do I really think that, like, 
this interview was, like, yes, it's great that we're talking and it's great that I get a chance to say what's on my mind, but I'm, I'm not anybody. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like, you need the industry to listen at an executive level and I think they're kind of hearing it, but I think there's still a little bit of, like, they're just giving us lip service, you know, a little bit of lip service. Just slap a black person on the front of something and then it's okay. You don't have to do any actual real work. They certainly can't make any decisions about who gets money, what kind of programs are put forth, what kind of bikes you put out, who, what, what, what athletes you sign. It doesn't have to be a, oops, you know, all oh, this is embarrassing. Or like, I mean, we won't even talk, like, who's pulling the plug on certain CEOs' ability to get in front of a camera? I mean, that's, a, that's somebody black better get in there and do something because, wow. Anyway, but I digress. No, no, I think, <laughs> again, I think you go further down that road, but I want to uh, kind of come back to, to what you're doing because you have taken on some responsibility now, despite the fact that you're saying you're just one person. Uh, but, but you are, and that's where I want to kind of transition to your work, uh, well, work with Right Upgrades, but really that is an organization that you've created yourself, uh, you're, you're spearheading, and I want you to tell us a little bit more about that. I think it's rightupgrades.org mm -hmm. is the website, yep. uh, so everybody can, can check that out for more information. Uh, but tell us a little bit about Right Upgrades, what you do, how you came up with it, and then maybe we'll go and talk a little bit more about your two two scholarship re recipients yeah. currently, right? Yeah. yeah. But let's start with how it all, how how you, it all how, started. Yeah. Uh, I knew I wanted to give some bikes away. I knew that ride that road bikes were kind of missing a little something, and then we had a bunch of programs here in the city that were kind of that do their own thing, but could probably come together. At least we can bridge a few gaps. And certainly we want. Uh, I was thinking about I Challenge Myself. I used to work for an organization called I Challenge Myself, and they do a uh, in-school road cycling program, but they don't give bikes away at the end, and they don't do racing. Uh, there's only one road racing program that I know of, and it ain't free. It ain't fully free. They can make it work with you, but it ain't free. And I was thinking to myself, like, okay, well, and they're only in one location, and there's all these stipulations, and no one really hears about them, and the outreach isn't there. And I'm just like, okay, so how do we either we're growing that program or we're creating our own kind of thing? Also, that program doesn't really do transportation equity. They're for racing, which is fine. They're for racing and riding bikes, and that's awesome. Um, but they don't, like, teach people to commute, which is how I got my start, and probably something that's going to be most useful to you. If you live in the city, you probably you need to know how to get around, even if you're just gonna ride to train you've got to at least be able to ride from your house to the park or from your house to 9w or wherever um so that's really where my the idea for ride upgrades came in i felt like we could do you know the sedent help people who are already kind of sedentary turn sedentary people into cyclists and turn or sedentary people into cyclists and commuters into competitors right so like people who are already riding around or people who are like riding that single speed life bring them over i'm just saying or people that have like a regular commuter and they're ready to like take a longer ride we can help with that you know what i mean or kids really it's like every parent is not going to want to come out the gate and drop 600 dollars on a bike a road bike for their kid that drops and breaks stuff just saying if it were me and i was you know a parent i'd be like oh that's kind of that's a daunting especially if i was a parent that already knew that the sport was kind of expensive like okay you get the bike but now you just need shoes and now you need a helmet and god forbid this kid falls and cracks his helmet now you need another one and you probably need a computer we won't get into power meters or anything like that let's talk about training and are we going to get this kid a trainer you know what i mean like it starts those costs start to add up and now we're putting aside the time this kid's now not working right because they're going to be spending time training so all these things kind of come into play and i was like how can i help how can I, like, there were definitely a couple of kids that I particularly worked with and I challenged myself and I was like, wow, this kid's not getting a bike. That's kind of messed up. Like, he would, can, he would clearly continue to use it. They, boys and girls, would continue to use these bikes, given the chance. And I was like, how can I make this happen? How can I make, like, a free road bike summer camp? Is there such a thing? Not here. Um, so, reached out to Alex, kind of let him know what I was doing. He took it and ran with it. I was like, thank God. But also kind of like, oh God, all right, all right, get something together. We need bikes, we need things, we need, yeah. So that's how that kind of got started. And um, I knew that I could at least swing the scholarships. Even if they didn't come out as fancy as they ended up coming out, I knew that I could probably get that done this year. The camp thing takes a lot. Um, but that hopefully will be um, organized for 2021. We have our dates set out and we have our sponsors. We just gotta get some kids. That sounds awesome. So this is something where you half push yourself, half got pushed into the water, had to swim. Uh, this yeah. is something really just kind of for its first year, your first two scholarship recipients mm -hmm. uh, started in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and and tell us about, so, so the goal of the program is uh, to get 
uh, to expand road cycling. It's road specific. Like, yeah, we will work with anybody, but I'm gathering road bikes. Um, road seems to be the one, one of those hard to touch, um, sports or disciplines, right? Like we talked BMX, maybe I mentioned you, BMX is the city's like thing. Like if we are going to have like a number of, but like anybody who has, if we're going to go just on the numbers alone, BMX has it, I would say. Track is the one that you see visibly, thus that us as cyclists recognize as other cyclists that are not, just not like it, us exactly. <laughs> they're out there and they're huge, especially because we have casino. Very lucky to have a track, right? Um, and then you have a mountain. It's not really a thing. I hate to say it, but mountain. It's not really not in the city. Yeah, we have Cunningham or whatever, but it's a, it's a city. It's not. You don't. We don't have mountains, so for real mountain biking to take place. That's not really a thing that happens here. But I was trying to kind of like grow the road biking scene. It's, it was amazing to me when I found out about Yusha McGowan that we didn't still, I was like, what, wait, what? That's another first? There's no black female pro? And she's, an, she's like a, an alternative pro. Like she's not doing the traditional route. And you know what I'm saying? So yes, we have one, but we had to get one because like we had, she was like crowing about it. But that was like, there's a point that we don't have one. So now I'm like, how do we, you got to start people young. You're talking about the sport. And it not just being a leisure activity or a transportation equity issue, then you got to start people young, and you got to give them the mental wherewithal and security to be able to pursue a sport at a higher level. It's not just being like, "Oh, here's a bike, you're good now, right?" It's more like you know the ability to be like, "I can, I don't have to go out and, and slave on a, at a summer job because I know that I'm covered. I know that I can, I'll have insurance and I have my team backing." So like. You know, I have support in that race that I want to go to, and if I crash, it's not the end of the world. These are basic things. Like, kids kids these days can't be... Like, if you wanted to put a kid into the Olympics, probably not the kid who's worried about whether or not his parents are going to be able to pay for his plane ticket and their kid to go, their, other, their brother or sister go to school. They're not going to be the kid that has to go pick up their kid from class. You know what I mean? You have to kind of make allow like you have to create a space where those kids also have opportunities otherwise you're always going to get like a certain type of individual that gets into the sport so that's kind of the reason behind it um besides the fact that i just like i like road bikes and everybody should have a road bike that's it it doesn't have to be super deep like i don't think i'm going to change you know the way america is going or whatever based on just giving a few kids a road bike but i certainly like Think back on like, like I said, with my with my dad, if I had been given this thing when I was much younger, where would I be now? How, what kind of focus would it have given me in my life? So you're kind of stepping in there, and you're that in that role of like, almost like a, a third parent, like providing some support, and then stepping in here. Here's the bike. Mm -hmm. So those two scholarship uh, recipients, mm -hmm. uh, you can see on the website, on her website, Instagram, who they are. So I don't, I think we need to go into the detail in, in all the details. Mm -hmm. um, Shout out to Travis Newmut. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think you've been really good at highlighting them and putting them, showing them on their bikes as they get in their bikes and all that. And uh, and I think you're working with Trek Bicycles yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, have some support there. And you mentioned other sponsors too for camp next year. Is that right? Or... That's Trek. And that's really the big one. Um, the idea behind Rider Breeds, I didn't really think I was going to have anybody. So I don't know. Was, you know, I named it something that reflects how I kind of go about my life. Like, my bike's not fancy. I've never had a... My new bike was is a no brand, no name brand. You know what I mean? Like I was like, okay, you know, you want to get stronger, ride more, ride upgrades. The strongest I've ever been was when I was commuting to uh, Washington Heights every week. Like, you know, those, you're climbing a thousand miles, a uh, thousand feet a week. So of course you're going to, so it was 150 miles, a thousand, thousand miles, a thousand feet a week. So of course I was stronger. And that was, that's like my mentality when I was approaching this. So yeah, I was lucky to, I was very lucky to get track though. I was, I was thinking to myself, I was like, how am I going to, Putting on a road camp is oh, it's pricey <laughs> because you're it's the, it's the bikes. You know what I mean? It, it, at a certain point, you, you're getting 20 kids. You don't know what size those 20 kids are. So now you're either you're limiting the age of the kids so that they're only a certain height and you're turning away anybody who's outside that height. Or you're you have a crazy range of bicycles that you can mix and match with this group of children. So I knew that I was already going to be sticking my hand out for something that was a big ask. Um, and there were no bikes to be had because we we're already deep into the bike shortage of, you know, the bike boom. So there was no like, oh, I'm just going to order 20 bikes and we'll have them. No, you're not. Because you know, even if you knew that each kid and their size, you're never going to get those and have them put together. And then with what money? 
So they're just like, and then you're talking about paying your coaches and you're talking about getting food and snacks and you're talking about getting insurance and a location to have all this. So once I put all that together, I was like, I need a shop. And, you know, shops finally got a second to breathe um, with this year being like the big boom year. And that it was very, it was going to be a big ask to stick out your hand and say, with no sight on theme, mind you, because I hadn't done the uh, scholarship yet. The scholarship was just, these are all just ideas. Sight on theme, stick out my hand, give me 30 grand and 20 bikes and space in the morning at like eight in the morning for two weeks. I'm sure that every shop, you know what I mean? Like that's a big ass. So one of the big things that I keep wanting to push for is bikes and schools and like, like a Stringer kind of got up there. You remember Scott Stringer made that big announcement. Oh, we need to support all these organizations getting bikes into schools and make sure that students can ride to school. And I'm like, okay, you've said this, now what? I'm wondering, please, anybody in the DOE, please write to Constantine, tell him what you guys are doing. Write to us, let us know, because I don't know. Um, I don't know. Is it just something that they made a grand announcement about and they're not really doing anything about it? And if, and if they do want to do something about it, this is a chance for those forgotten companies who are scrambling to try and look woke to do something. I, yeah, you heard it first. I don't think I'm the good, the right point of contact there because people like Aaliyah are, are running organizations that can only maybe give them a platform a little bit for five minutes uh, <laughs> or an hour. Uh, but but I think you are doing the groundwork, right? And others are doing the groundwork. I think we've, we've you can you can you really quickly um, I want to talk about uh, what your scholarship recipients are actually getting, mm -hmm. and then also, but you've mentioned a bunch of other organizations that work in that space. So mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, I challenge myself. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, New York Junior Cycling, Star Trek is a big one. They don't even know how help they good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we give them a lot of shout out on this show too. So Star Trek, Star support Trek them, but, but they're doing yeah. all right. They're doing fine. They're beloved, and they, but it's they're beloved because their program works. So it's like you can't really crap on something like it. It works. Uh, that said, so it's, what do we say? Star Trek, New York Junior Cycling. Um, I challenge myself that does Cycling Smarts. Uh, Outride does have a couple of schools here mm -hmm. in the city that are middle school based cycling programs. That's a specialized program. Yeah. That's a specialized program. They are middle school based and they are like hybrid bikes. They're not road or they're not track. They're not, yeah, that said, remember, increments, steps, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of if you, Bike New York is the big one. I don't know what they're still, they're kind of still doing things, but you know, obviously everybody's getting a hard, everybody's had a hard time this year. 2020 is hard year. I'm trying to think of some other kids programs that are for cycling and the mountain biking. NICA has a mountain mm. bike. Are they uh, out here now? Yeah, they, they've been out here for, I think they've been out here for a while. Um, and they are in Fort Oh, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. So. so a little further out where it's a little greener and you have some hills. And mm -hmm. like you said, mountain biking is a little bit in the city. You, you, yeah, we have one park uh, and that's kind of, I, I know I'm oversimplifying and I'm sure the mountain biking community has things to say, but I know sorry, they're gonna get dragged. Sorry. it's kind of how it is. <laughs> it is how it is. They're, they really do, they, they have done some outreach and I think they are partnering or at least we're partnering with that challenge myself because the school is like right behind one of their sites and it was right on Inwood Park or whatever that is on the east side. It doesn't even Inwood Park, but whatever it is, it's right behind, um, uh, oh gosh, that school that's right up on Audubon, George Washington. It's right behind. They have a, the site right there, and they do maintain that park, and that park is pretty gnarly as far as, like, you know, you just decide to ride mountain bike in that because it's, like, basically vertical. Um, but so, it's awesome. It's an awesome location for, you know. Sounds whatever. like I wouldn't ride it, so I, 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 I have a lot of respect for them anyway. But... Uh, and then, so let's come back to your scholarship mm -hmm. recipients, ah, Umit yeah. and Travis. Travis. So what did they get? What did they get this year? Because it might change every year in terms of the year. support you can get. Right. But what did they get this year? And what's the goal that are you still working with them mm -hmm. in twenty? Are you going to work with them twenty twenty one? What What are you doing with them? What did they get? Uh, they get a bike. They get all the accoutrements that go with the bike, so they can actually ride, which means kit, helmet, shoes, cool, cool shoes, um, pedals, computer. And what am I forgetting? Uh, I think that's it as far as like the hardcore stuff. And then they get like a travel stipend, which we're still uh, travel to wear because COVID. Um, travel stipend and team placement. So the idea was that we not just like give them the stuff and kind of throw them to the wolves. It's like, hey, come meet up with us, ride. That's really where Alex comes in. Cause you know, Alex mm -hmm. and his welcoming, welcoming team um, was, you know, the perfect kind of start to get Travis kind of like out into the roadie world. And he came and rode with him a couple of times and we'll get him out to every club that he wants to, to try. Obviously this year's kind of, this year's kind of a weird year because a lot of clubs, at first clubs were not really being open about having 
other people come in because group rides are frowned upon. Um, and some people were not doing group rides at all. So we're still like kind of just getting them out there. Now we got them, you know, trainer, somebody donated two trainers. Thank you so much. We have donated trainers and they'll be training. Unfortunately, the trainer does not take disc. So we are still working through all the little mm. side things that we have to have to kind of get this to run smoothly. But the idea is to give somebody support um, kind of up until they can up. Uh, I know that that's, Alex is probably like, no, no, no. But I'm like, yeah, dude, you know, seeing this is the obviously we're going to have to like, you can't just be like, okay, now you're on your team. Bye. Good luck. You know what I mean? It's, it's more like building a community and supporting the riders that come up underneath you. You are kind of like their third, their auntie. Or their co you're their coach. You're a coach, essentially. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're taking these people, especially Uma. Uma's, um, Travis kind of came into it already built. He already knew what he wanted to do. He was just kind of giving him the stuff. Um, Uma, uh, it was like her first road bike. You know what I mean? So she was riding a bike with like safety brakes before. So got a ways to go, but it's like a huge opportunity for her. You know what I mean? And I was like, I remember her as, I don't tell the story a million times and I will tell it all the time. She was the only kid when I was working with I Challenge Myself that got out on the track. So I rode them over to Casina, or at least they rode over Casina on their own. And I met them there because I wasn't, I was the coordinator that year. And no one else wanted to go out there. They were all scared. She was the only girl. And it was a Saturday. It was just busy. And they were like, obviously, that's why they were like, mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed and shy. And they didn't want, you know what I mean? David Harrison, who was also there that day from Star Trek, was like, oh, yeah, you guys, go ahead, take a lap. Uh, no, no, all the kids were denying it. She was like, of course, she was not going to ride miles from Gravesend all the way to there and then not go around. Of course, she rode around the track, and I still remember that to this day. So when I was thinking of reaching out to people, of course, I, I tried my one girl that I had on, um, that was old enough, that, that I had on uh, the college bike tour. And then I was like, oh, look, if it's not her, then it's definitely Uma. And here she is, she got it. That's awesome. I know she was in Gravesend. That's my hood. So yeah, it's not a bike friendly neighborhood where you just kind of pick it up and go with it. Right. So I'm really glad that you're doing that and you're providing that transition. That's almost like the transition from high school to college kind of, or something mm -hmm. like that, but you're taking them through there or you're trying to take them for the first year of college and not just be, okay, you're going to college, see you later, mm -hmm. but you are saying, okay, I'll, I'll still be there. or We'll try to be there still as you are starting to, to raise and start to write more and start to find another group and, and yeah. we'll help you with that. And, and I feel like with Umut, this was a moment where I was like, do I have to force these kids to race? Because for me, I was being, I didn't feel like I was, I didn't hate it, I wasn't, but I wasn't like, oh, I'm gung-ho to like, let's get up at four in the morning. We're gonna go around Central Park. No, we're, I'm not. I like riding my bike for fun, I like riding fast, socially acceptable to race. <laughs> if you are, to go fast, you need to, to, for it to be socially acceptable to go fast, you need to be racing. So that's kind of how I got into that. But it did make me aware that, like, Umut's presence made me aware that maybe we need to be a little more flexible um, in reflecting what other riders want to get out of cycling. Yes, we want her to compete, but maybe she's competing in something that's, like, a, a rival event. Like, she's not doing crits or whatever. She's got a ways to go. Obviously, 2020 wasn't the time to be making a ton of decisions. We just got to get her up and riding and we'll go from there. All right, uh, we took a little break because we've been having a really good conversation, but um, I can't hold still for that long. And also, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to be really good about shutting up in between and letting you talk because we're doing more of an interview style conversation. Or we're doing an interview this time, not so much a conversation where I constantly interject. Um, and I had a lot of follow-up questions, but I think I don't want to tackle all of them right now. But one, one thing that I think was interesting, again, um, your heritage is Caribbean, uh, is that right? African American. My dad's from here. Or my dad's from, <laughs> let's rephrase. My dad was born in St. Vincent and came here when he was eight. Um, but he's, he spends a lot of time going back and forth. He definitely identifies as West Indian. My mom was born here. You call it West Indian. That's interesting. So that's, that's, that's strong. I said strong. it's Caribbean. Yeah. Is, is that a difference? Is that a, does I mean, a maybe difference? that is, that could be a New York thing. Okay. Like here we can say Boricua and people know we talk about Puerto Rican. I don't feel like that would fly somewhere else. Maybe not. But whatever the case is, I call him West Indian. Yeah. I can't call him Jamaican because he's not Jamaican. Sure, okay. He yeah, does have some land around, he's scattered Saint, around, Saint, Saint, made Saint, in Jamaica. Yeah. have some family around, but right. So on, on that note, um, we just talked about, okay, so you're talking or you're representing in some ways the black cycling community as mm -hmm. are, are these figureheads like Asia McGon, the Williams brothers who have had incredible success, I would say 20 for 2020, at least they have, and they're these figureheads, right? Allow me to interject for a second there. I don't feel like I am represent. I mean, like, I, only when I get into an environment like this, 
that otherwise I'm just a regular person. <laughs> you're just a regular cyclist. It only it's only when you're othered, you know what I mean, that you're representing any broader oh representation matters. Like, no, I'm dropping you. That's what matters. Pay attention. <laughs> like that, you know what I mean? Like these are there are some things that are more important. Ultimately, I hope my legs. I'll say it with my legs. As far as that's another shout out to uh, another uh, pro black cyclist. Uh, and I mean positively promoting black blackness, not an actual pro. Um, but yeah, so, so I just wanted to pause there and say like, uh, yeah, I'm black, and it's, I guess as a result of that, I feel like I have to say certain things because you're gonna ask you about it. But otherwise, I don't, you know. I represent black cyclists in the way that you represent white cyclists. And if that's fair, then sure. <laughs> I 100% agree. And I, but I think that, that was where the question before came from, right? Where, which is the question of, do you feel like you're getting pushed in that role? And it sounds like you do. Uh, even though you feel like you, sh you are not necessarily representing them any more than, than anybody else, right? So, which, which totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you do feel a little bit pushed in that role. I'm asking you about it here, right? Like, would I ask you if you were white about, like, white cyclists and race? Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I'm trying to selectively um, talk about that for sure. I think you have pretty good knowledge and opinions about it. That's why I'm asking you about it. Um, I think there's other people who are quieter or less likely to share an opinion if they have it, which, mm -hmm. which you know, race can be a touchy subject. Uh, is a very... It's a no-go for some people, right? So mm -hmm. I, I don't touch it with everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm glad that you are able and willing to talk about here um so let's let's dig in deeper uh and we we uh touched on that already because you said the other so the red camps were this west indian spin-off of the lnm cycling club group mm -hmm. LM tours. um tours yeah mm -hmm. and then major taylor is really more the african-american group oh um, there are west indian people and they cross over and when they do the big major taylor does the big ride so they kind of inherited that uh mythos from lnm or at least the responsibility whatever that is for Ellen from LNM for doing those big rides like Montauk, New Hope and on a pop which is Princeton. So everybody comes out for those red caps. Now my dad has told me this story a million times. Alex has dodged the story at least twice that they do that ride, but they leave like an hour early and they add on like 10 miles. <laughs> so they're, they will do that. They're there. They're around on the same day, but they're not in, you know what I mean? Like they're their own club and they're doing their own thing. Yeah, we'll just say that. So there is some separation. Other clubs do that too, right? Yeah. Though, ride, your, ride your bike shows up and they ride with us. So we haven't, now. we've talked about Ride Your Bike yet, mm -hmm. which is another group that seems to be not only, but also more West Indian dominated out mm -hmm. of more Brooklyn Prospect Park mm -hmm. too, which is, we should say, at least one of the centers of the West Indian community in, in, uh, in New York City. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's another one, but I think it's definitely the, the east of, southeast of Prospect mm -hmm. Park area. But I do want to say that I feel like a lot of this separation is not so much because of the geographic area um, or where the people are from but where you ride right like if you're the head of major taylor's based uptown so of course you and so sorry personally for me if i'm gonna go for i like hills so i'm not gonna go ride a million times around rockaways like or out to wherever to long island oh that freaks me out like doing the long island rides you need that group so i yeah i personally i'm scared and that's a, i prefer to go north so i'll end up with the people who are riding from 9w and riding you know riding 9w from strictly that's usually major taylor uh, ride your bike does not. They dig ride east because they're mostly in Brooklyn. So it's like you get up an hour earlier. If you want to meet meet those riders uptown, you're getting up an hour earlier than you would if you were going to meet people to ride from from Brooklyn. So I get it. So that they do the Rockaway Loop and they kind of go there. I see. They do the Rockaway Loop. They do. They do some bad rides. They they fast. Definitely, they are a great group to ride with. However, if I'm like, I felt like there would be a lot of me. Just yes, they are a lot of men and they are also West Indian. They're younger, though, so it's not quite the same vibe that you get from the Red Caps, but it is flat, and they are, they're a hammer, it's a hammer fest. So I feel like there is some separation, yes, in geographic area or nationality or whatever, but it's probably more about your style of riding, because I definitely know some other women who are not even, not even black women who ride, ride your bike. People try and pop up on, their Red Caps is savage, I don't know, I don't, you know, I'm looking to see who's going to hang and who's going to stick, but they seem kind of cold. <laughs> they will they're yeah they're they're a tough nut to crack okay yeah. okay you heard here okay yeah i'm not familiar with them so i can't absolutely not vouch for that but i believe you mm. um I, i've seen ride your bike out there so so you're saying that 
while there is some grouping by cultures or nationalities, ethnicity, the, mm -hmm. which I think is completely normal. Like we, we've talked with Lucia uh, Dengo, who is the CRCA president, outgoing is now on a U USA Cycling Board, actually, which is great to have uh, New York City represented there. Mm -hmm. um, she said, okay, well, one of the things with CRCA, yes, it's predominantly white, yes, it's predominantly affluent. And in some ways, of course, that is, uh, I think that's what she said, and I, I think that we see that all over and over in society that the this organization like school like everything it reflects the the demographics of the place right and manhattan right. being generally more affluent generally being let's say less brown or mm -hmm. less uh you know whatever you want to call diverse. it diverse that's diverse mm -hmm. yeah um that is reflected in crc to some extent right and we have groups in within crc that are more diverse and less diverse uh, and that's not that's not really the point but you think then the point is really that to some extent a lot of these groups and organizations which makes a lot of sense right because like you said if if i mean i ride with a lot of people a lot of people from our team are in manhattan and then i have to ride 20 miles an hour or so to get to the men you know to uh, grant's tomb up there yeah on there, you know? yeah and, and it's it's great in some ways i always get some extra miles in but sometimes you're like Oof. i'm tired <laughs> and then you're getting you're getting up that extra hour early and sometimes you're in the dark as a result, it's colder, so now you're bringing that extra layer of whatever because you're going to be out there in cold. But yeah, uh, sorry. Didn't no, layer is a great word. Da da da. Transition. Uh, <laughs> because we're going to talk about your um, your Instagram handles, kit addiction. Uh, I do see a lot of different kits. Yeah. Um, so that has has that been part of the attraction for you coming into cycling? You're in a, you're in a bright pink outfit right now. You're afraid of some pink. Uh, I saw you on Instagram the other day with the new, I thought we were really stunning, that major Taylor kind of dark blue and gold or something like yeah, that. It's black, Beautiful. Yeah, it's black. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a great uh, jersey. So is this something that was just like a convenient Instagram handle or are you really a little bit beyond even for the fashion addicted cyclist, average cyclist who has a ton of different kits in there? in their wardrobe. Ooh, Alex is going to hate this one. All right. Um, see, here's the thing. I got into kids. I used to be like that weird, like I said before, I was like, I know I'm never going to wear a like, or why would I do that? That's dumb. Da -da 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 -da. You put it on under your clothes. Okay. Then it was like, okay, this is, I'm sweaty. This is, <laughs> it's starting to get hot and you're riding longer and it's, it, again, really hot. <laughs> you're trying to do something and by the time you get to work, you're damp. Now I see you're bringing clothes or you're wearing something quick dry and that's when the kit thing started to kind of like, you embrace, I was forced to embrace the form that I had. Um, I was always like the weird tall black girl in a, a, a place where people, girls weren't tall or weren't black. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, or a school where that was like the thing, or there was a few of us, but not that many or, you know, whatever I like to do was a weird, I was the weird outlier. So like finally wearing, wearing kits, you're wearing your underwear. You know what I mean? You're wearing, you're wearing like your underwear. <laughs> um, so, you know, once you kind of like embrace that this is how you feel the most comfortable to do what you're for a purpose it's not just like i'm putting this on for somebody else i'm putting this on so that i feel comfortable and that was me owning i guess owning my body and and kind of like taking ownership of my clothing when i choose to put on myself um and the kit thing kind of like grew from there then you're looking for things that look good and that kind of like still express what you you know you're not i don't feel like wearing i didn't feel like wearing, wearing rafa everyone else rafa was the thing when i was starting to get into this um, and I was like, okay, you all kind of, and also they were not nice. They didn't like, there was, you know, Rafa has like a, kind of had like a bad reputation at the point that I got into it. Oh, he made a face. I'm like, I'd love to hear your opinion on that. But I will tell you, Rafa did not have the greatest like reputation because of probably because of the cost and the way that their, I guess maybe some of their riders were not always nice and they were on group rides. Um, they kind of represented that bad roadie vibe that is just rude. Um, that I never really wanted to duplicate. So I was definitely going to find kit that was loud and interesting, kind of like streetwear, but not. And that's how I, I didn't know Alex, but I knew Ostra's jean bibs, which he doesn't make anymore. And I, I admit that they're horrible. Fine. People don't like them. I love them. Whatever. Fine. They were great. But I remember seeing them on Chris, who was uh, another member of Major Taylor. And being like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Da -da -da. Kind of getting obsessed with it. Starting to hunt for things that were unique and like trying to find my own style I understood then that kits were like your uniform and I hadn't committed to a club yet this was before Major Taylor and I was like I was like just getting into the like I had just met them because I just met Chris that's just Major Taylor guy so I didn't really have that like oh I have to wear this one outfit every time I go out so that's the one other thing that kind of comes along like I had always been those people like I never had a suit a job where I was like required to wear a suit so like the suit 
that as Kit kind of like, I bucked that as well. So then the addiction of constantly searching for things that were like, okay, we're gonna mix and match, let's find something else. That became kind of like my, my addiction. Why is it an addiction? Kit is expensive. Kit is freaking expensive. And wow, yeah, like that's why it is kind of an Do I need this? No, I don't need it. But do I feel better when I have it on? Yes, yes I do. Um, and that also drew me to looking, I guess, a little more deeply about into the kits that I'm buying and kits for a cause kind of like makes a huge difference to me. So Alex obviously constantly giving away his kit and time, <laughs> um, to people and was designing kits for free for I challenge myself. So, um, that of course endeared me to him. Um, and he was kind enough to let me model this uh, when he found out I was working for I Challenge Myself. He was kind enough to let me model it and I kind of like took it, you know, just ran with it. Thank you again, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Um, so now I've kind of like keep my eye to the ground for other kits that are for a cause. The kit that you mentioned, the Major Taylor kit, proceeds are, um, some of the proceeds are going to the NAACP Legal mm -hmm. Defense Fund. So that's huge. Proceeds from this go to I Challenge Myself as well, you know. Um, there's another red kit that I have that I'm like obsessed with that I got from, um, ride, not ride your bike co-op. What is their co-op called? I'm a terrible person, but they're saying is say it with your legs by Ennis Luby. He's another guy who black cyclist who moved from Britain to California and opened uh, a co-op. I think it is ride something. I think it was ride your bike co-op. I feel like a terrible person for not knowing this, but I'll have to look it up later. Whatever the case is, kits for a cause, kits that give back in some way. So that when somebody asks you about it, you can, oh, thanks. This is that. Now you can give an explanation of like, oh, this is this organization, this organization that you should support or they could love, they'd love to have another coach or something like that. You know what I mean? But yeah, it is an addiction because you don't need this and it's expensive. So yeah. yeah. I, and I think you clearly have a you, you mentioned you have more of the, what do you want to call it? Creative, a little bit louder, a little bit um, mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. right? Um, on, on the Rafa note, I, I can't speak for the group rights. Um, I could see that with the expensive kit and the, the look comes a bit of that don't touch me attitude or not being that accessible and approachable. And uh, again, I have never really seen or been in contact with the group rights. Uh, I, I certainly, with the Soho location and the price tags, I think I go in there and I feel the same. Mm -hmm. um, I like the designs personally, uh, but that's a style uh, question yeah. and everybody has different style preferences. But I don't, I think I own one item that I did not buy myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dislike, again, don't dislike them. And I feel like they have come around. They have been very supportive though. Like they've hosted things for free and they're willing to, they're, they're, they host things and they try for what they are. Let's not be unrealistic, right? It's business to make money. It's not, they're just like for completely altruistic purposes. Um, that said, I feel like it's maybe just a New York thing. Like they're the attitude issue that, that have, has kind of been perceived as a result of this or like associated with Strava or Strava with Rafa in some way. I'm not seeing that in other places. So maybe it's just here. I hope. Ooh, now we have to talk about New York City and attitude. We'll both we'll table that for another time. Mm -hmm. I do wanna do wanna finish that up uh, and, and, and ask you what, what's coming for you in twenty twenty one. Assuming the vaccines work and are coming in a somewhat timely fashion and we're all vaccinated and actually immune and considered immune and it's all safe to write in groups and maybe even race at some point this year that isn't like September. Yeah, what's, right. what's, uh, you've talked about a camp already for write up grades. Uh, so maybe what for write up grades and what for um, you personally? For write up grades, definitely summer camp. That was the idea. It is the perfect time to ride. Kids should be on bikes. Uh, summer camp from July, I think it's like the second week in July, July 12th to the 23rd. And it'd be during the week. So we're still, we'll obviously start recruiting later, but we're following the COVID guidelines. The idea about the camp being a bike thing is that it's outside. So divide them up and keep them separate and keep them, you know what I mean? It's still an activity. Parents have to go to work. So we want to do just something um, during the week that would kind of like make it easier for that to happen. Uh, and we are planning on doing family rides in the spring. Let's see how that, obviously COVID is wreaking havoc with plans, but we are, we do have smaller bikes to support getting parents out with their kids. So like the idea, like I said, is the idea is to catch them young. You're not going to get your, you know, tiny child that's going to outgrow a 44 in like five seconds. You're not going to spend $800 on a size 44. You're not. So we have those. So what we want to do is offer opportunities for groups like Black Girls Do Bike to bring their kids. So you already have a bike. You want to get your kid who already knows how to ride on a bike. Boom. 
get your kid into road bikes. This is, um, and we can't necessarily, I'm not eager to do learn to rides with uh, road bikes. It's brand new, brand new road bikes. Uh, what I can do is teach people who already don't, who haven't used drop bars before or shifters, brifters before to use those things and how much easier is it. Da, 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 da. So that is our goal for spring. Um, for myself personally, I have really, I had all these grand plans for all these travels I was going to take this year that obviously didn't happen. And now that this is ride of crazy is going, it's not going to happen. Um, but what I will do, I already booked like a week away in Harriman, my like happy place. So I will go stay in a cabin in Harriman and ride up and down hills that are real hills that take 20 minutes. Um, and just be happy for that week. That's like, this is it. I'm keeping my <laughs> expectations low so I don't get disappointed. You know what I mean? We yeah. should add that's like 20 miles outside the city. So, yeah. yeah. So it's not it's not much of a trip. You could ride there. Yeah, you can ride there. It's 30 miles to get out there, though. I ain't 20, but yeah. Definitely don't, me. Don't I thought to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the conversation. Thank I'll give you. you a COVID elbow. COVID elbow. <laughs> and uh, we'll see this online soon. Thank you. Thank you.